Welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am Colin Slade, and today I'm being joined by Lieutenant Colonel Phil Ferris. Welcome, sir. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it. So this episode is a continuation of the series that we're doing on AFI One Tech Two, Commander's Responsibilities, getting commentary from sitting and graduated commanders. And we're going to give you the opportunity, sir, to introduce yourself because you're actually both of those things. You're both a sitting <laughs> and a graduated commander. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah, this is my second gig. Awesome. So either you did it so well the first time that they just had to let you do it again, or maybe there was something that you still needed to learn. <laughs> so they're giving you a second shot at it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I don't know, there's not enough uh, folks to go around. So they're like, yep, we'll do this again. <laughs> there is that too. Yeah, for sure. And we're going to talk about that. Never enough people, right? Correct. Yep. Well, great, sir. So before we get into the rebroadcast of this episode, give you the opportunity for you to introduce yourself. What has been your experience coming into the Air Force, serving as an officer, then as a commander? Give the audience an idea of who is Lieutenant Colonel Phil Ferris. Yeah, sure. So I commissioned in May of 2006 from uh, the University of Georgia. It's a ROTC program. Go dogs, right? Yeah, go dogs. Yeah, so came in as a security forces officer, and uh, within security forces, I've been you know all the way from a, a flight commander as a, a second lieutenant to the officer in charge of logistics and readiness to operations officer, you know which most uh, most career fields call uh, director of operations, mm -hmm. and then uh, chief of security forces, which is kind of like a quasi command gig where you're the uh, the top defender on the yard without you know G series orders and without being that commander and then uh yeah moved to uh, my first squadron command and, and then now on my second squadron command but yeah a proud defender proud security forces officer joined the career field because i wanted to be that ground pounder element of the united states air force and really i was captivated by you know defensor fortis right i mean strong defender or brave defender in latin and uh, being that defender that's in charge of everything dealing with uh, air-based defense and protecting all personnel and resources on the base. And that ranges from, you know, the airman that you see on the front gate that's, uh, you know, scanning your ID card yeah. all the way to, uh, you know, law enforcement, you know, traditional law enforcement that you see on the base with patrols, you know, all the way to, um, you know, being deployed downrange and we're doing convoy operations and detainee ops and patrols outside the wire, uh, kind of runs the gamut. Anything that deals with, you know, protection of the force and of the assets, you know, we do it. As a lot of people say, jack of all trades and master of none. None, but uh, it's, <laughs> right, <laughs> it's been an awesome career. Yeah, and we've had a security forces officer previously on the show. That was Reed's friend, Captain Johnny Jopling, gave his perspective on it, and we really appreciated the perspective that he shared. But his experience was obviously different from yours, especially given that he left active duty. Where here you've stayed on active duty for a while. He had his reasons for leaving. You've had your reasons for staying. And one is not better than the other, but just shows that every career is a little bit different. And I would like to hear from you, sir, what have been your reasons for staying on active duty, staying in the career field, especially one like security forces, which you're no stranger to. It often gets a bad rap, right? Yeah, it does. So, yeah, the initial reason I joined is because, uh, like I said, I wanted to be that ground pounder element. I grew up wanting to be in the Army or the Marine Corps, but through fate and mentors and advice, I ended up getting an Air Force ROTC scholarship. So, okay. commission in security forces, you know, the closest to it, arguably. But I've stayed in the career field because I've always had that sense of duty ever since I've been little, wanted to be in the military, never wanted to do anything else. And this career field has always provided me various different 
options that that keeps me from being bored. Uh, that's, oh, that's good. <laughs> Maybe that's good. I don't know. You've yeah. You've been a commander for a number of years now. And boredom for a commander is a never a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I started off at Moody and it was all aircraft security and law enforcement, you know, with a deployment there too. And then I went to Minot, which I I believe the other security force officer that you had did the missile field up at uh, either F.E. Warren or or Malmstrom. So I did the exact same thing up at Minot. And I don't know, I always got a, a kick out of that because we were out in the missile field, you know, by ourselves, you know, like uh, the previous officer said, you know, in charge of roughly arm to the teeth, arm to the teeth. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with 203 <laughs> grenade launchers and 249 and 240 machine guns and all kinds of other things. And, and then we would constantly exercise and practice. And, you know, me as the flight commander controlling helicopters and controlling designated marksmen, which is kind of like an air force, you know, sniper and doing all of this, uh, you know, crazy, you know, different scenarios and stuff and the amount of responsibility and authority that you have as a, I, had a, I was a first lieutenant at the time, you know, was interesting. And, you know, we have one of the biggest enlisted career fields in the Air Force. I think, right. I think total force, we were at 35,000 right now. Wow. And we have one of the smallest officer career fields. So what that means is, is that most of the time there's like a one to 45 or one to 50 ratio. So another reason I've stayed in is just, I've liked that, you know, enlisted connection, if you will, and feel like I'm really making an impact in a lot of airmen's lives and kind of bounce it around. But, you know, after my night, you know, went to Aviano and that was, you know, very unique as well in a foreign country. Sure. And uh, fast forward a little bit, you know, the current job I'm in now is the commander of the 569th United States Forces Police Squadron, which is the last police squadron in the Air Force. And uh, we're actually responsible for an area the size of Rhode Island oh, wow. or the size of Luxembourg, whatever you want to compare it to. And uh, there's about 60,000 U.S. SOFA affiliated, you know, personnel around here. And we are basically the law enforcement agency for this entire area. We have jurisdiction off base. We could pull people over off base. Any crime that happens where a SOFA affiliated, you know, American is the subject, we have jurisdiction over. So this is an extremely unique, yeah. you know, mission set in the Air Force, which once again, keeps me from being bored. Yeah, obviously, uh, especially now um, as a commander, you know, never a dull moment, right? Absolutely. And that leads us into what the rebroadcast is today. This is episode number 17, Managing Resources. And sir, you're going to stick around to provide some commentary on the backside. Really looking forward to your perspective, especially when talking about managing airmen, managing their time and the resources, the equipment, the stuff that they need to accomplish the mission, especially in a situation such as yours, where so many people so much land and area that you're responsible for. So greatly looking forward to your comments on the backside. So with that, let's turn it over to the episode managing resources. So we'd like to welcome you all back here as we continue our discussion on the things that the Air Force values in its officers. We visited the topics of executing the mission and then leading airmen, which gives us that typically a cliche phrase of mission first, people always. But as we'll find out in this episode today, it takes a lot more than just a willingness to focus on the mission first and a bunch of people motivated to accomplish a mission to actually get the mission done. What do you think there, Reed? It all boils down to the resources, the money, money, money. This is a super important thing. And It is a lot more important than I ever understood when I was starting my journey to become an officer. So hopefully we'll give you guys some good tools, some good references. We've got a bunch of links that we'll probably post in the show notes about all of this as we do our best to explain, you know, the budgetary process for the United States government and its impact on you as an officer. Yeah. So as a reminder, if you go to Air Force Instruction 1-2, if you look in there, you'll see the responsibilities of an officer they are entrusted with resources to accomplish a stated mission. Those resources include manpower, funds, equipment, facilities, and environment, guidance, and lastly, airmen's time. As an officer, you have to manage these resources well in order to, number one, take care of the mission. You have to execute the mission using the the resources that are available to you. And being a good steward of those resources, as we will see here in just a little bit, 
those resources are provided by the taxpayer. And so we have to be a good steward of their money and that public trust. And then one of those resources is the manpower, which goes back to our discussion that you need to take care of your people so that they can take care of the mission. So on that note there, Reed, why don't you uh, lead us through a little bit of a discussion of where we get these resources from? All right. So I know all of our listeners came here today just for a brief civics lessons. Just kidding. They didn't, but it's essential. You've got to understand it. So we're going to go through it very briefly. Again, we've collected some links. We'll put those in the show notes so you can have some background reading. All right. The budget. How do we get funds in the federal government? Well, first and foremost, Congress is the only organization that has the authority to collect taxes and spend money. And so it's going to involve Congress. Wait, wait, wait. We got to emphasize that point. So the Department of the Air Force falls under the Department of Defense, which is led by Secretary of Defense, who reports directly to the President of the United States, who is the commander in chief of the military. That is correct. But you're saying that because of the way our government is set up, the president does not have the authority to spend money. That is correct. That authority to spend money instead has to come from Congress. Yep. Welcome to Checks and Balances. Good job, Colin. You've done well. Thank you. All right. So how does the budget get created? How does it start? All the agencies and departments that are part of the federal government create a budget request. And this request goes to the White House. The White House puts them all together. And this becomes the, the presidential budget, essentially. And they send it to Congress. Now, the Air Force contributes to this, like Colin stated, through the DOD portion of this request. And this involves a process called the POM, or the Program Objective Memorandum. Essentially, the Air Force says, this is what we need to do the mission that we need to do. And all of this gets put together into the big budget. The president creates it, sends it to Congress. The next step is that Congress debates, adjusts, creates a budget through the process of what it is that Congress does, legislation. Then they send this budget back to the president who signs it or doesn't. This process that the Congress goes through is called appropriations. It's where they actually allocate funds against specific things. We'll talk more about this in a little bit. And that is essentially how a budget gets done. Now, a key component of this is all of this has to get done before the end of the fiscal year. Colin, what's the fiscal year for the federal government? Oh, gosh. All right. <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting into some of the, the nitty gritty and fun things about how the budget works. The fiscal year runs from October 1 to September 30th of the following year. So it does not follow our Julian calendar that runs January through December, but starts beginning of October and ends in September. Exactly. And so what happens when this process isn't completed in time is the federal government runs out of money and we have a government shutdown. There's a common mechanism that is used to avoid shutdowns and it's called a continuing resolution or a CR. And in a sense, it's another appropriations bill. It's Congress saying you can spend this money and by and large, it usually says, whatever we've told you in the past, just keep doing that. Here's a pot of money you can continue to spend. Yeah, essentially, Congress is saying is we haven't gotten our act together yet to be able to actually pass a legitimate budget. So it's just going to be what we've always done is what we're going to continue to do. And this is a highly political process, highly politicized. It's very messy. Anytime the budget discussion is happening, it's going to be, you know, a center of national politics and it's going to be a big, messy, sticky process. So, okay, why do we care? Again, here we are, you know, officers doing our officer thing, trying to lead in the Air Force. If you don't get the budget through, you don't know how much money you have. If you don't know how much money you have, you don't know what resources, what manpower, what facilities, what equipment, what supplies. And then do you have the knock-on effects of that? Okay, so that's the budget process, and we talked a little bit about what is appropriations. 
And if you want to get that in a much shorter, much more entertaining version, go watch Schoolhouse Rock. You know, I'm just a bill sitting on Capitol Hill. Perfect. Yep. Same process. All right. There's one more bill that we need to talk about that's really important with respect to defense spending. This is the National Defense Authorization Act, or the NDAA. A little background on this. It's basically been passed every year since 1961. It's one of the most bipartisan and like longest running continuously passed bills that is out there. That hasn't stopped it from being difficult or controversial. It's just a point of fact. The thing that the NDAA does is it provides the roadmap. It says, this is what you may spend your money on when you get it. It's not an appropriations bill, which actually gives you money. It's a roadmap, if you will, a budget. This is what you can spend money on when you get it. And so between these two things, the actual budget and the NDAA dictates how we can spend our money as the DOD. Does that cover it, Colin? Does that cover how we get money in the U.S. Air Force? Yeah, I think that gives us enough information on how we as officers in the Air Force are affected by what happens at the federal level. That our money just doesn't just appear out of nowhere. It has to come from somewhere, and that somewhere is Congress. And Congress, as we know, the federal government, as we know, can often find itself in gridlock. It can find itself functioning or not functioning at any given moment. So we as federal employees, as officers in the Air Force, are subject to the political nature of what Congress and the president are involved in. Absolutely. Yeah, it's entirely different than a market-driven business where you are selling a product, you are focused on the success of that product or service, and when people buy, subscribe, like your product or service, your company makes money. And yet, we are very much tied to the finances, the resources we have. And it leads to a lot of trickle-down effects. And I think that's where we're going to go next. We're going to talk about the so what. How does this impact our daily life? And how can we lead in this type of situation? Why don't you start us off with the first category there, Colin? How does this impact me every day? Yeah, so one of the first things that is mentioned as a resource is manpower. We talked about leading your people, and this is where that ends up connecting with this idea of resources is that your people are a resource to you and they are paid for by Congress through this budget and the NDAA. The reality of the situation is that you are never going to have enough people to fully accomplish all that you want to. There's always more mission to be done than you have the resources for, including your people. So what that means is that managing your people quickly becomes one of the most important and challenging things that you will ever be responsible for as an officer in the Air Force. You need to figure out a way to use them in such a way that you don't burn them out. Now, this is going to include setting up specific systems and procedures in order to make sure that your people are taken care of, that they're organized, trained, and equipped to accomplish the mission. And the reality is that you're just never going to have enough people to do all the things that you need to. So some of the things that you need to consider when you're leading your people is how can you get the most out of the people that you have available to you? Consider what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? What is the level of their training? How are they organized? Are there ways that you can be more effective by changing the way that they're organized or getting them a different type of training so that you're not burning them out, so that you're not grinding them into a pulp trying to get the mission done. We use the phrase managing people, and it is the right phrase. Let's separate people from personnel and think about it from an idea of actual numbers of people. Do I have enough people? When someone PCSs, am I getting a replacement person? The actual bodies that we're talking about, you know, how are they organized? Do I have the flight structure organized appropriately? Do I have the right number of people working on the right part of the mission? 
do I need shift work? Do I not need shift work? If I do, do you know, how do I wrote, do I set that up with, you know, a Panama schedule or do I do, you know, different ways of organizing? And we'll talk about time in a little bit. Yeah, it's separate from leading individuals and more about managing the overall process of how many bodies do I have and what are they doing? Yeah, your responsibility as an officer towards your people is to organize, train, and equip them. Organizing them is the actual structure itself of what position they are in relative to the manning document. Are they the right rank? Do they have the right experience? Have they achieved their five or their seven or their nine level? Are they the right person to manage a, a, a shop or a section or to be a flight superintendent or a squadron superintendent, do you have the right type of person in the right position at the right time? So that's the organized piece of it. And then training and equipment, that comes further down, but has dramatic impacts on how you are using your manpower that's available to you. Because if you don't have the right training or the right equipment, then that's going to have a dramatic impact on how your people get used. Exactly. So let's move on to some of the next categories. Let's talk about funds, funding. So we actually do get some funds to perform the mission. Sometimes this is tied directly to the mission, like money for gas to fly the jet, or it can be tied to something like travel. You have a certain amount of funding allocated to you for travel. This is going to be part of your responsibility. How do you allocate that funding? Who gets how much? Are we going to allow rental cars on a TDY? Are we following all of the joint travel regulations? We'll talk about that later when we talk about guidance. Something I see a lot of in leadership is they're talking about, are we spending our money at the right rate? So you have so much, it comes at the beginning of the fiscal year. Are we spending it appropriately or are we spending too much too quickly? Are we going to run out of money before the end of the fiscal year? Do we have enough flexibility in our budget. This is all stuff and it's a big part of your time. You spend a lot of time doing this, making sure that you have the right funds and that they're getting where they need to be, getting spent where they need to. People that own these different pieces, you want to become friends with them. Yes. You know, it's interesting. When I commissioned, my uncle was the command master chief petty officer of the Coast Guard, retired, and he came to my commissioning. And one of the things he taught me is he said, first, you always need to be kind to everyone, but there are three people you need to be extra kind to. The people who manage your healthcare, the people who manage your money, and the people who manage your assignments. He's like, those three people, you need to be extra kind. Grovel, beg, whatever it takes, bribe, within reason, of course, right? We're not asking people to violate their integrity here, but these people will become your best friends. And you need to use them well. You need to understand this process. Because if you don't, I've seen a whole lot of Air Force Times articles with people getting busted in very big ways for the misuse, misallocation of funds. Yep. So that is the first thing that's going to get you sent to jail is the misuse of funds. And even if that isn't what started the investigation, you know, say it's an IG complaint about leadership or something. It's kind of like with Al Capone, right? Like he was a horrible human being doing really bad things, but he ultimately got busted for taxes, you know, tax evasion. This is kind of the same thing. So got to do this right. And we'll talk about more about that when we get into guidance. But yeah, we do get some actual money allocated for very specific things. One that kind of quickly comes to mind is travel, you know, temporary duties, where you need to send your folks to a conference or they need to go travel to some specific location for training. Things like, do we have enough money to send them to training? How many people are we going to send? Are we following all the joint travel regulations? Are they going to get a rental car or are they not? We spend money throughout the year and we track very carefully. Are we spending our money at the right rate? Are we going to run out before the end of the year? This takes a lot of a leader's time. They have to be very careful about their funds and, and pay attention to it. Yeah. If a leader, if an officer is going to go to jail for really anything, it's most likely going to be related to mismanagement of funds. And this is something that you as an officer in the Air Force do not 
want to mess around with. You want to make sure that you are dotting all of your I's, crossing all of your T's with regards to the way that you use your money. So how do you do that? Well, you could pick up a copy of the FAR, the F-A-R, Federal Acquisition Regulation, and you know, become an expert on it yourself. Or you could just become best friends with the wing finance officer or comptroller, as well as a contracting officer within the contracting squadron in the mission support group. These people are your best resource for making sure that you are spending money correctly. Now, they're going to have representatives embedded in each of the different squadrons because the, the importance of using money correctly is that important. But it behooves you as an officer in the Air Force, no matter where you are at any level, but especially if you are in a command position, to be intimately familiar with and great friends with a finance officer and a contracting officer because the finance officer is the one who's going to manage the actual budgeting of those funds and tracking, as you called it, read the burn rate, how quickly you are spending money, making sure that you are not going too fast or too slow so that you don't have too much left at the end of the fiscal year or have not enough to get the mission done. You don't want to find yourself two months out from the end of the fiscal year with inability to pay for gas or to keep the lights on in your facilities because that would be bad. And then the contracting officer is the individual who is actually responsible for the spending of money. They're the ones that sign the checks. They are the ones that have authority from Congress to actually spend money on behalf of the federal government. No other person in the Air Force can spend money. Only a contracting officer who has been given that authority by Congress can do so. So don't think that just because you've got somebody in your unit who holds a government purchase card is able to you know, spend money on whatever it is that you think that you need in order to get the mission done, that it doesn't work that way. Become best friends with the finance officer and the contracting officer. Absolutely. Colin, why don't you take us through equipment? You probably had a lot of that in CE. I have a little bit less of that. I'm mostly focused on like technology stuff, you know, computers and things in my mission. But uh, what about equipment? Yeah. As we said before, your responsibility as an officer is to make sure that your people are correctly organized, trained, and equipped. So let's talk about equipment for a second. In order to accomplish a mission, quite frequently, you are going to require some sort of equipment. Now, that equipment may be an aircraft itself. Aircraft is a form of equipment, and that equipment must be funded, must be purchased, must be maintained correctly using all of those resources that we've covered previously, the funds and the manpower. But in addition to the aircraft, there's all of the equipment that goes into the maintenance of the aircraft, you know, such as air ground equipment or vehicles or the nuts, bolts, parts and pieces that go on the aircraft or the vehicles that are needed to support the mission or anything else. You know, it could be applied to our computers, our networks, our satellites in the sky, anything that is not bolted down to the ground or is a building, anything that moves or helps you to accomplish the mission in any sort of way is known as equipment. And that stuff must be managed properly. It must be fully accounted for. It must be budgeted for by a finance officer. It must be purchased by a contracting officer. And your responsibility as an officer is to make sure that all of that stuff is being used properly. And hey, it's possible for you to get a different piece of equipment that is either cheaper, faster, better at accomplishing the mission. You need to pursue that. Same with taking care of that equipment, right? If you are trying to maintain an aircraft and you can find a cheaper, faster, better way to do that with a different piece of equipment or taking care of it in a better way, all while following the rules, we need to be looking at and trying to get after those things. We need to be efficient and frugal and responsible with the government's money. Similar to the topic of funds and being best friends with the finance officer and the contracting officer, you still want to be best friends with them with regards to equipment. 
But another person that you need to get familiar with and be best friends with is a logistics readiness officer, especially the squadron commander for logistics, because they are the ones that are going to provide you the majority of your equipment. They're going to help you to get new equipment or to maintain the stuff that you already have. Awesome. So in addition to equipment, you need a facility that supports the mission that they are involved in. So an example is if there are maintainers that are working on an aircraft, they need a hangar. They need a building that surrounds the aircraft and gets them out of the elements and is able to store all of their equipment so that they can perform proper maintenance on the aircraft. If you are an Intel officer, you need a place that protects all of your sensitive computers, servers, information, so that you are able to share that with the people who need to know. If you are a security forces, you need some sort of way of protecting each of these different missions. Perimeter fence, badging doors that you need to badge into, bulletproof glass, all of these different things that are rolled into this idea of facilities, the place where the mission is able to take place. And the fact is that there is never enough space in those facilities to accomplish your mission. Just like there's never enough manpower, there's never enough funds, there's never enough equipment. There's never enough facilities and everybody always wants a new or a bigger building. And so you as an officer in the Air Force, regardless of what your responsibility is, what your career field is, you need a facility. And therefore, you want to be best friends. Again, you want to be best friends with the finance officer and the contracting officer because they're the ones that are going to buy you a new building. But you also need to be best friends with a civil engineering officer, specifically what's known as the base civil engineer. Now, the base civil engineer or the BCE is the is typically going to be the commander of the civil engineering squadron. So get to know that person because they are going to help you identify the requirement of the facility to support your mission and connect it to the right kind of right kind and amount of money so that you can get it funded and help you to take care of your mission. But the bottom line is here, you're never going to have enough space. You're never going to have enough facilities. You're never going to have enough equipment. You're never going to have enough money. You're never going to have enough people. And so your challenge as an officer in the Air Force is to be able to accomplish the mission within the constraints on the resources that you have. Awesome rundown. Thanks, Colin. Next category we wanted to talk about is guidance regulations. This is a really big category and we've kind of, I mean, we can't even talk about all of the other categories without mentioning guidance rules. There are so many rules and there should be, right? We have been tasked by our government to spend our government's money, which comes from the people. And we should be good stewards of that. You know, I've had a little bit of exposure to this. I was the approving official for the squadron for a year. What an approving official does is someone in the squadron needs something or some stuff. They need to spend some money. They would make a request and I would have to make sure that they were following all the guidance that we have to follow in order to purchase that thing appropriately. It isn't like you just have a credit card and say, oh, I need some computer paper, and you drive down to the local big box store and find the cheapest you can. That is not how this works. It's not even close. There's a whole bunch of laws we have to follow. We have to double and triple check to make sure we're compliant. Just a few examples. There are a number of environmental laws that are uniquely applied to the federal government and their employees. There are a number of made in USA regulations. There is the Wagner O'Day Act, which requires the U.S. government to purchase things made by blind individuals. Now, I don't want anyone to think I'm being pejorative in any way about these regulations. I'm just pointing out the incredibly complex regulatory framework that we have to operate in as members of the federal government as we spend our money. And we haven't even gotten into the idea of colors of money. If you remember back from the top of our discussion, the NDAA outlines how we can spend our money. It gives very specific categories in which you can allocate funds and you cannot move money between those types of funds. So let's say, for example, that you have 
O&M funds or operations and maintenance. You can only spend that money on operations and maintenance. Then there's another category of funds, which is R&D or research and development. You can't spend R&D funds on anything else other than R&D. And because you can't move money around, it can get tricky. Let's say, for example, Colin, that your squadron has a bunch of computers and they are just garbage. It's time to replace them. So you spend you know, a couple months figuring out how much it's going to cost. Uh, you notice you don't have enough money for it. So you put in the request. Next year, you get that funded and you're like, great, I can replace my entire squadron's computer budget. You know, because I have the budget, I can replace all the computers. So you replace all the computers and great. Now the problem is is you've gotten this money at one time in the past and next year comes. You're like, well, I don't need any computer budget because I got my computers replaced this last year. So you don't request any money and you don't get it. Well, what happens next time you try to request money for computers is you may not get it. Because we can't move money around, we can't carry it over fiscal years. There's this widespread attitude that you have to spend your money every year or you won't get the same next year. And the logic is, if you didn't need all the money that we gave you last year, well, then you certainly don't need that much again. So we're going to cut your budget. And this fear disincentivizes savings and people end up spending their money every year, no matter what. You go to websites that are you know, common vendors for the federal government, and there's literally a countdown clock. You know, fiscal year ends in 21 days, 17 hours, 12 minutes, you know, and the idea is you better spend all your money before the end of the fiscal year. And this is something that has been identified. Our service chiefs have, you know, gone to Congress. We'll provide a link of an example of this. When in 2014, all the service chiefs from all of the services asked for some flexibility from Congress to allow us to save money a little bit better. And they denied that request. We respect that. But it's a challenging situation to be at the end of a fiscal year with surplus budget in X category and be directed to go buy a bunch of stuff. And, you know, it's tough. It's a tough situation, but the guidance, it's a big one. It's everywhere. Make sure you're staying on the right side of the law on this one. Just a quick story from civil engineering. I've mentioned in a previous episode that Civil engineering gets to spend 90% of the wing commander's budget on the base. And let me explain how that actually happens. So I mentioned that everybody wants a new facility, right? Everybody wants more space. And the way that usually works is that as we near the end of the fiscal year, different units on the base realize that they haven't been able to spend enough of their money. Now, this is usually O&M funds, operations and maintenance, because that's the type of money that units are typically given. And so they have this money left over. And like you were saying, Reed, there's this fear that if that money doesn't get spent, then they're just going to lose it. And really, it's the wing that is afraid that they're going to lose the money. That's where all the money truly exists. The wing commander gets to dictate you know, where their priorities are. The finance officer helps the wing commander to budget it and the contracting officer executes it. So at the end of the fiscal year, all of these different units say they can't spend their money. So the wing pulls that money back up and they got to find a way to quickly spend however many thousands or millions of dollars that they have left. and. You know, we could spend that money on a bunch of TV screens and put them up in every hallway, in every office, in every bathroom on the base, but that might not actually spend it all. And so what they do is they go to civil engineering and they say, hey, can you use this money to build some buildings or perform some maintenance on buildings? Because buildings are really expensive. and Inevitably, we say, yep, we can take that money. We can execute it. We'll get it spent. And so the month and the weeks leading up to the end of the fiscal year, civil engineering is like on fire, just programming all of these different projects, connecting it to these funds, sending it over to the finance officer 
to get their approval and over to contracting to get it executed. And so in just a matter of a month, civil engineering can take this multi-million dollar surplus that's left over in the in the wing commander's budget and just eliminate it, just execute it all, get it spent down to zero. The reason that this happens every single year is because of this guidance, because there are so many regulations on how and when money can get used that it falls to an organization like civil engineering that spends lots and lots of money. Or another example would be the logistics squadron, logistics readiness squadron, spending money on fuel and supporting additional training hours, you know, additional flying hours for the pilots so that that money gets spent down so that we can get that money again the following year. Yeah, it's a super tricky situation and there are good reasons for it. You don't want, you know, the Air Force buying bombs and not building child care centers. You know, that there needs to be a balance. This is the way we work within the laws. And all of this is to still say, as an officer and an agent responsible for spending the government's money, you have an obligation to not be a spendthrift. You need to be frugal. You need to be responsible with your allocated funds and spend them according to the guidance to take care of the mission and to take care of your folks. I think it's important to recognize here, you mentioned it earlier, but let's reiterate the point that the Air Force and the rest of the federal government is not set up like a business. It's not set up like the free market. We recognize that if there was a business that operated like the Air Force, they would go bankrupt and out of business almost immediately. And so it doesn't do a whole lot of good for you to apply that lens of the free market and how the business world works to how we do things in the Air Force. That will just lead you down a path of extreme frustration and anxiety over how it is that the Air Force and other federal agencies have to, by congressional law, use the money, use taxpayer dollars. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks for bringing that up, Colin. Last category we are going to talk about today with respect to you know, this idea of managing resources as something the Air Force values is time. And boy, this is for me personally, this is a huge thing. I've been a part of and been required to support 24-hour missions before. And that has formed a, you know, left an indelible mark on how I view time and how I view leaders and their way they manage this as a resource. And you'll spend a lot of time, see what I did there, thinking about how we can do things faster or more efficiently. Can we save man hours from process A in order to spend more time in process B? Or can I move airmen to do something else? But time management, managing the time of your folks is an absolutely critical thing that you must be concerned with. And I'm not just talking about like making sure that all your folks are punching the clock at exactly 7.30 and 16.30 every day. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a much bigger picture. I have too many airmen doing this process and it's taking too much time. If I could develop algorithm or a product or a process that can reduce that, that's the kind of time that we're talking about here. Do you have any examples from your experience? My experience in civil engineering during my first tour on active duty taught me that my time is not my own, that my time belongs to the mission and Sometimes that requires significant time spent engaged in the mission. I'll give you an example. Within my first month of arrival at my first duty station there at Joint Base Andrews, Washington, D.C. was hit in the same week by a hurricane and an earthquake. And one of the responsibilities of civil engineering is to do disaster assessment and response. So whenever a disaster strikes, either man-made or caused by nature, CE doesn't stop. You know, civil engineering doesn't stop. While the flying mission may stop or go someplace else, while you know, some other things may not be able to continue 
doing their normal day-to-day ops, civil engineering continues to operate in that we are out there assessing the facilities, assessing the runway, assessing all of the facilities, the stuff that is on the base to make sure that it is operational. And if it's not, what needs to be done in order to fix it? And so when this happened for that week, the entire civil engineering squadron was running essentially 24-7. We were all on shift work. We had it set up where people would work 12 to 14, 15, 18 hour days, go home, sleep a little bit, shave, get something to eat, come back and do it all over again. And that lasted a week. And obviously that it's unsustainable for the long term, but it goes to show that your time is not your own, but it's a resource that you as an officer have to manage for your people because whatever amount of time it takes to get the mission done is what needs to be spent. And if you are able to find a way to limit or decrease that amount of time, make it so that people can do things faster, if they can get around and assess those buildings and the damages that have been done faster, if they can get the electricity back on, if they can repair the runway faster, if they can reposition that satellite, if they can push a contract through faster, if they can, whatever it is, if they can do things faster, that means that more mission can get done in a shorter amount of time or more mission can get done in the same amount of time. Awesome. You know, Colin, as you were telling your story about time, it made me think about one situation I found myself in early in my career, hadn't even commissioned yet, when I realized I was part of something much bigger and this, you know, tying myself directly to things that were happening at the federal level. It was the second time in my life that I can remember things happening on the national news having direct impact into my life. The first time I was about eight years old, Desert Storm was happening. I lived on Hill Air Force Base. My dad was in the Air Force. He actually had paperwork filed for separation, had an approved separation date. We were planning a move. We were packing up the house and Desert Storm started, and all that stopped. He had to stay in the Air Force for about another 18 months. All of the parents of all the kids I knew were going off to war. You know, So that had a direct impact on my life, this thing that was happening at the national level and I was watching on the news. The next time that I can recall that happening was when I was at OTS, and they're going through the third round of continuing resolution. The government had shut down, and the squadron commander of the training squadron I was in pulled all the students into an auditorium and explained how we weren't going to get paid because of this budgetary process. And then the squadron commander began to instruct us, hey, as officers, you're going to have to manage resources. You're going to have to take care of your people. Here are some of the things on base that you have to help you do this. He taught us as students how to manage resources. And it was fascinating to me that all of the things that this commander had to be paying attention to in order to not only accomplish the mission, but take care of their people. And it really left an impression on me. And it was kind of when it started to get real that I was joining you know, a big organization, doing big things that was well connected to the goings on in the world. And it just really left an impression. And I think that's a take home I want for our listeners. Being an officer is such a big thing. It's so much more than just a rank that you wear or a specific role you fill, it's really all-encompassing. You truly have to be involved in a lot of things. And managing resources is absolutely one of those things. It'll take a lot of your time and energy to manage this stuff, even though it's not something that necessarily comes to the forefront when you think about what we do. Absolutely. I think that is an excellent story, excellent way of explaining the magnitude of what it is that we as officers are dealing with, with respect to managing resources. And I just want to share a brief anecdote from my experience. If you remember back in 2012, we went into sequestration and essentially the federal government decided that it was time to cut way back on federal spending. And what that ended up doing, you know, the trickle down effects all the way down to my squadron, it turned into a furlough for the, the civilian personnel in our squadron. And for, I think it was 15 days, all non-essential, anybody who is not critical to 
the accomplishment of the mission was told to stay home and they would not be paid. However, that was just the civilians and all of the blue suitors, the enlisted and the officers had to stay and continue working, even knowing that there was a possibility that we were not going to get paid. And I remember showing up on the first day of the furlough and the squadron was a ghost town. And yet the mission still had to get done. It didn't stop. Despite this congressional dictate down all the way to my squadron that, that the civilians stay home, the mission did not stop. The officers and the enlisted still were there having to take care of the mission. And it is just another example of how this is all encompassing. This is not just a job that if your business runs out of money, the work stops. That doesn't happen in the Air Force. There are things that will stop if the money stops flowing, but the requirement to maintain national security and the defense of our nation does not go away, despite any sort of issues that we run into with regards to the budget, the NDAA, all the way down to how we manage resources at the level of the squadron and the flight. So as someone who wants to be involved in this, or someone who is already involved in this as an officer, you need to be aware of these things and take them seriously. Awesome. Thanks, Colin. All right, listeners, thanks for engaging with us again this week and listening along as we go through our short series on the things the Air Force values. And if there are any questions, please feel free to email us at airforceofficerpodcast at gmail.com or engage with us on social media. More than happy to take your questions. And we also want to thank all the listeners that have contacted us through Facebook, Instagram, email, et cetera. We love engaging with our listeners and we're happy to answer any of your questions. Thanks for listening to another episode of Commission Ed. All right, sir. So you've now had a chance to listen to this episode. So as the audience, we've all been reminded of what is meant by resources that you as a commander are in charge of manpower and funds and equipment and facilities and time and, 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 uh, sir, yeah. <laughs> there's so much going on here. As a two-time commander, you've had a lot of experience with this. When you hear all of this stuff that you're responsible for and you read it in the guidance and you see everything that you have to do, how do you not get so overwhelmed? Like, <laughs> how do you know what to prioritize? What is the most important thing to you as a commander? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it could be overwhelming. It can be a lot of stuff for sure. I've been lucky to have some good mentors along the way, but really it comes down to trusting your people. You know, I trust my senior NCOs. I trust my officers and I trust my NCOs. And for the most part, right, they know what they're doing and they can get the job done. The other aspect of that, right, when I'm talking about for the most part is I think the main job of a commander is to provide that guidance and intent and then help other agencies help out the unit. So like you said, there's many different aspects of managing resources, but to me, the commander really needs to focus on the guidance aspect and the airman's time. Okay. So there's different interpretations of, of guidance and, you know, in one tack two, it gives you know, some examples and stuff. But for me, guidance is really comes down to commander's intent, really talking about the vision for the unit and talking about the priorities, you know, for the unit. Once you establish that commander's intent, it really enables everybody within the unit and really, you know, the senior leaders like senior NCOs and CGOs to be moving in the same direction. And honestly, that guidance feeds into another aspect of managing resources of uh, airman's time. Guidance helps to prioritize the airman's time. You mentioned that uh, it could be overwhelming for commanders, mm -hmm. but it's really overwhelming for NCOs and, and airmen that are trying to run various different programs and stuff because between NICT and then all of the AFIs, I'm not exaggerating, there's probably thousands upon thousands of requirements that we're technically supposed to do. Sure. But it comes down to it's impossible. It really is impossible. If experience has taught me anything, it's impossible to meet all those requirements. So that guidance helps prioritize that airman's time so that they can actually, you know, understand, you know, from the DOD instructions, the AFIs, installation, you know, OIs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They can understand how to prioritize that workload then a commander provides that top cover. 
you know, because you're always going to have other units that come in or whatever that they think that, uh, you know, their requirement is, you know, more important. And I'm not talking bad about, you know, other AFSCs and things like that. But from a commander perspective, right, we know what the squadron needs to focus on. Yeah. Providing that guidance helps, you know, protect that airman's time. Now, that's an interesting thing. We don't always think of guidance as a resource, but it certainly is, especially when you look at it as something that enables something else, right? Mm -hmm. Just like how money enables people, facilities enables the mission, guidance in this case, in the example that you're using, guidance enables the management of time, the proper use of time. And the NCO is going to be like, sir, I've got a hundred things that I got to do today. I can give you five of those. So what are those five? And you providing that guidance and you were also receiving guidance from a higher headquarters, major command saying, these are the things that are most important to the MAGCOM or the COCOM or something like that. Yep. Then you can filter that down and provide that to the NCO who can then feed that to the airmen, thereby, hopefully, <laughs> everybody knows what it is that they're supposed to be focused on. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we're constantly having to adjust up because, you know, sometimes our <laughs> <laughs> sometimes the intent and priorities get, uh, you know, they have to be altered based off group, wing, and matchcom, you know, intent. <laughs> adjust up, I like that. <laughs> Leading up. Same idea, right? Absolutely. So one thing that I am interested to hear from you is some examples of where you've seen this carried out successfully, or even probably more instructively, you have failures of using resources effectively, where the guidance wasn't provided in, so time was wasted, or there was a lack in funding or a surplus of funding that made it... Uh, Right. You laugh because surpluses never happen, right? <laughs> but if you could give some examples of where you've seen both success and failure in the management of resources as a commander. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's probably, you know, a lot of successes and even more failures <laughs> that I can't sure. think of right now. But yeah, a couple come to mind. So on the uh, success side of the house, Without going into you know too many you know details that will bore your listeners, our armory here in this current unit is actually uh, very very small, and it doesn't meet our mission requirements. So that was one of the priorities you know I had was actually to modernize our facilities, and uh, so we developed a short term you know mid term and long term plan. So as a part of that short term plan, trying to get a, a space saver. Right, if you're familiar, you know, with that, right? Sure. And then the intermediate plan is something called a an R mag, which is basically a semi permanent armory. And you know, as a part of that, you know, guidance and then airman's time, it actually helps prioritize you know my time as well, obviously. So you have to steer and develop all resources, whether you're talking about you know funds, like you mentioned, equipment, facilities, but also it's DV visits and readiness reporting and staff meetings and et cetera, right? So once you have the intent and priorities and you have the way forward, then every single engagement with your higher ups can, you know, you can mold it to meet that intent and those priorities. So Literally every single time, like we had a new group commander that came in, new wing commander that came in, our numbered Air Force commander came around, I would steer him towards, you know, our arms room mm -hmm. and show, hey, see how small this is, right? And have the subject matter experts give a demo and talk about it. You know, the flip side, we were also ready to execute because we had everything in line with contracting and CE and, and whatnot. So we were ready to execute with funding for the space saver and then funding with the uh, RMAG. So I remember one of the DVs that came through, he was like, how much is it going to cost? And I was able to give him, you know, a cost for the RMAG. And he was like, hey, where is this on your priorities? Because when you're operating at that GO level, they care about the commander's priorities as far as you first, you know, unfunded right. requirements. And uh, just having that back pocket information that my team actually put together based off of, you know, intent and priorities and stuff, it actually got us the funding for that. So that was a way of, you know, guidance and airman's time was able, you know, for us to effectively get more resources. What's really important to me and what I want to pull out of this anecdote that you've shared is all of the work that you did on the back end in preparation for those conversations with decision makers. So in the episode, 
I tried to emphasize the importance of having a relationship with people who control the money, right? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, finance and contracting. And then because you're talking about a facility, speaking with civil engineering, making sure that all of those documents and those estimates are in place so that when a question like that comes from the DV, you can answer it and you're not caught flat footed and you say, here's this requirement. Okay. What's it going to take? Uh, I don't know. Right. That was for you to, to answer, I, right? Can you imagine how that would go with the DV there? Yep, absolutely. You know, and there's many different funding streams and, and things like that. And it's even harder in the radio community and the operational world. But within the support side, you know, I'll be honest with you. One of my mentors a long time ago, you know, told me that as long as you are ready, as long as you're ready to execute and you can actually articulate the requirement and the need, you'll get the money. And that's been my experience is that as long as we are ready and we properly articulate it and we show people, we always get the money. And a lot of the times it comes down to uh, other people aren't ready. And if you're ready to execute, then you get the funding from IMSC or the Matchcom or whatever. I cannot agree more. That has 100% been my experience as well. That So like while I was a civil engineer working the, the programming of such facilities, and handling fallout money, you know, leftover money that hadn't been spent yet. That's exactly what it always was. Who's ready to execute? Yep. Who has identified the requirement, done the estimate, has all the documents prepared so that contracting and finance can say, okay, there's your money, go. Because that's what civil engineering does all the time. We were always ready to go because mm -hmm. we're constantly working facilities and estimates and all those sorts of things. But it doesn't have to happen just with facilities. If you're looking for a piece of equipment, if you need additional manpower, do the work, make the justification, have all your documents in line so that when the request comes, you can easily answer it and get the thing that you need. Yep. So that was a successful yeah. <laughs> story. But like you said, there's probably more failures and the failures are even more instructive, right? They tell us what we've done wrong and where we can improve. So Sir, instruct us. Yeah, so I've had some of my uh, my folks compare me to um, Mattis, Mattis, you know, old SecDef Mattis, because well, that's a compliment. Well, not so much. Hold on for a second. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you've read his book before, Call Sign Chaos. It's a fantastic right? book. Recommend it for everybody. It is a fantastic book. But if you remember, right? I don't know if it was a joke or whatever, but they called him Chaos, right? Because it stood for. <laughs> What commander has another outstanding, uh, I forgot what the S stands for, drawing a blank. Solution. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, outstanding solution. So, yeah, so my senior NCOs joke about that with me, and then also about uh, like good idea fairies, right? So, I guess a failure, another example from this current command, just because I have a short memory sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when I first got here, established the intent establish the vision, establish the priorities in conjunction with my senior NCOs and officers. And we're like, all right, cool. Here's a way forward, right? But inevitably, things happen throughout the year where I encounter something. And I'm like, yeah, we need to work on that too. So yeah, there's a go-do, right? And I encounter something else. There's another go-do. Yeah. And then my group commander gets involved and my wing commander gets involved with other things, right? And uh -huh. there's a priority and there's a priority, there's a priority. So about a year into my command, Kind of like what you were talking about before, where I have you know airmen and NCO saying, "Hey, I have all of these things to do, a hundred and something things to do. I can only do five. Well, my failure was I didn't realize that throughout the year things were piling up. Yeah, <laughs> and it became a point where everything is a priority, right? So because of some advice from uh, my sage chief, I ended up doing a reprioritization, if you will, mm -hmm. of the priorities with each section, basically saying, yep, I get it. Tell me everything before this meeting. Tell me everything that you're tracking that I asked you to do. <laughs> we'll go into the meeting and I'll prioritize it for you. And some of my sections, yeah, they had a very long list. <laughs> and I realized that they were spinning their wheels trying to get all this stuff done. And I realized I failed as far as the same thing I was trying to prevent where there's you know hundreds or thousands of things and I'm trying to prioritize it for you and then provide top cover. I basically created that situation by not realizing that all of my you know, good idea fairies and then the group and the wing tacking on basically created the situation I was trying to avoid. <laughs> yeah, it happens to the best of us, right? We want to do our best to accomplish the mission and take care of people and be innovative within the unit, always looking for opportunities for improvement. And, 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 and that's why we get this 
long list of priorities, right? Yeah. But the reality is that when you have a hundred priorities, none of them are right. Nothing is actually a priority. And you mentioned it earlier that the best way that you can help your airmen is to provide them guidance. So in that type of situation, what sort of guidance did you give them? What was your process? Who did you talk to? What did you read to get that guidance and then provide that intent and envision to establish those priorities? You're talking about at the beginning when I first took command? Or after the fact, when they brought you the thousands of things that you've asked them to do and you needed to reprioritize and narrow it down to the things that actually mattered. Gotcha. Yeah. So when I first got here, um, so it was a little bit of a mixture of my priorities, like my perennial priorities and my philosophy. So I am big on training. Training has to be the number one priority, in my opinion, within, especially within security forces. I'm a firm believer that you very, very, very rarely rise to the occasion. You fall to your level of training. Right. So training is always a number one priority of mine. But then, you know, going around and, and visiting all the folks and talking to, you know, senior NCOs and NCOs started to develop a vision and, and other priorities uh, and whatnot. So that was really based off the training was still the priority, realistic, hands-on, practical training and less click, you know, click, 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 you know, PowerPoint, you know, slide training. But then that's where the other things came in as far as modernizing the unit, right? With the, the small arms room and our small uh, law enforcement desk that wasn't really functional and et cetera, et cetera. So it's a little bit of a mixture of, you know, what I come in with, with the conditions on the ground. And then as far as to answer your question, about a year into command, it's really, you know, going back to the original intent, right? Going back to the original intent, yeah. priorities that we established. And it's like, okay, so what are you doing, right? As far as various sections and stuff, what are you doing that does not feed into those priorities? Okay, so if it doesn't directly feed into those priorities, it's just a good idea and it's a nicety, let's rank that low. Yeah. But then, of course, kind of like we were talking about before, you have to adjust up. So there's some yeah. things, <laughs> some things that I don't necessarily view as a priority that my my group and wing commander do, and and those automatically get bumped up the list because it's a priority for them. But it's really like coming back to your core, if you will, like basically getting you know grounded again with the original priorities instead of all these good ideas, you know, instead of being chaos. And therein is the responsibility of the officer, of any officer, but most especially the officer who is given the authority of command for the unit is to provide that guidance, establish that intent, that vision, and when necessary, return back to it. Make sure that everybody's refocused back to what actually matters to include, as you've noted, the higher levels of leadership, having those conversations, tough conversations with group wing and higher levels of command leaders. Absolutely. Well, outstanding, sir. This has been a fantastic conversation. I certainly have benefited from hearing your perspective, reconfirming that you can't do everything. Airmen can't do everything. And so if you're going to manage resources effectively, there is a way to go about that. You can't do everything. So you have to provide the guidance. Well, you have to get the guidance <laughs> and then you have to provide the guidance down to the lowest level and then sometimes back up again in order to make sure that the things that really do matter is what everybody is focused on. Well, sir, now that we've reached the end of our discussion here, if anybody has additional questions that they want to pick your brain on about managing resources or maybe the security forces career field or what it's like being assigned to Germany, being responsible for an area the size of Rhode Island, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, what is the best way for them to do that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, if they're in the military, in the Air Force, they can reach me on Global. You know, I'm the only uh, Lieutenant Colonel Philip Ferris. And then I'm also on uh, a Facebook and Instagram, too. I'm always willing to answer questions and, and help people out. Awesome. All right, sir. You know how we like to end our episodes. So what does it mean to be a commander? Okay. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to sound like a, a beaten record, but uh, the commander is really the one that sets the intent and sets the vision and the priorities and really the the tone you know for the unit um we have great airmen ncos and senior ncos you know 99.9 percent .9 you know the people that join the air force want to do a good job every day they just need a a little bit of uh you know direction sometimes and, and like here's the intent and here's the priorities and it really starts with the commander and then the commander's job after that is really to take care it's become a cliche over the years but i truly believe it 
uh, take care of the troops so they can take care of the mission. And that taking care of it is, once again, vision and intent and priorities and shaping the environment for them to be successful, whether it's the right training, the right equipment, the right top cover, the right resources, you know, et cetera. And then the third responsibility is being up and out, you know, as far as understanding what other units bring to the fight, understand the group, understand the wing, and then leveraging those units and leveraging, you know, higher headquarters and the leadership chain in order to once again take care of the troops, take care of the units so they can better take care of the mission. Outstanding, sir. Thank you so much for your time, Lieutenant Colonel Ferris. It has been a pleasure. Is there anything else that you want to leave the audience with before we get out of here? I just want to say that I really appreciate uh, what y'all are doing with this podcast. And like I was telling you before, I've shared many a podcast with my CGOs. So I think you're uh, doing a great service to the Air Force. So I appreciate it. Well, thank you, sir. And that will conclude this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.